Please sit down. <clears throat> Seems strange for me to be welcoming you to Magdalen and to Tony's funeral, but a warm welcome all the same. I'm very grateful to the President and the Dean of Divinity for allowing me to take part in this service, and indeed to Tony for asking me. I don't want to trespass on William and Susan's territory in the tribute later on, but I do want to say that I count myself very fortunate to have had Tony as president when I was Dean of Divinity here in the 80s. I can also say he was literally an answer to prayer. In the original college statutes, it laid down that at the election of a president, the dean must offer a votive mass of the Holy Spirit before the fellows are locked into the chapel to vote. So I duly did offer a votive mass, and of course the Holy Spirit and the fellows got it right. From my point of view, Tony was an ideal head of house. He warmed the place up. Morden was always the best and most beautiful of colleges, but beauty and excellence have a distancing effect if you don't back them up with human warmth. And that's exactly what Tony did. He was friendly, hospitable, approachable, unpompous, self-deprecating, and sometimes vulnerable too, in a way that allowed you to be vulnerable as well. He remembered people's names and their stories to an extent that put me to shame. He made the president's lodging feel like a warm heart at the center of things, and the place became more of a community because of him. It also helped that Tony came to the chapel a lot. He loved the choir. He even liked sermons and wanted to talk about them. He was never just a spectator, but I would say someone with very strong spiritual convictions, trying, like the rest of us, to find the most authentic framework for making sense of them. We are honored today to have His Excellency the Ambassador of Bhutan with us. And I was delighted yesterday to receive pictures from Bhutan of His Majesty the King, who of course was here in Tony's time, offering thanks for his life and prayers for the progress of his soul. The temple ceremony involved the lighting of a thousand butter lamps before a large photo of Tony. Today's service is slightly less exotic, but the intention, I think, is the same. And I am certain Tony would have enjoyed both enormously. So let's give thanks for him and pray. God, our creator, you made us in your image to reflect something of you in this world. We give you thanks for Tony and for all the gifts that we received through him. And as you gave him to us, so now we give him back to you. And we pray that you will bring him to perfection in union with the love which is your life forever and ever. Amen. All wisdom cometh from the Lord and is with, with him forever. Who can number the sand of the sea and the drops of rain and the days of eternity? Who can find out the height of heaven and the breadth of earth and the deep and wisdom? 
wisdom hath been created before all things, and the understanding of prudence from everlasting. The word of God most high is the fountain of, of wisdom, and her ways are everlasting commandments. To whom hath the root of wisdom been revealed, or who hath known her wise counsels? There is one wise and greatly to be feared, the Lord sitting upon his throne. He created her and saw her and numbered her and poured her out upon all his works. She is with all flesh according to his gift and he hath given her to them that love him. The fear of the Lord is honour and glory and gladness and a crown of rejoicing. The fear of the Lord maketh a merry heart and giveth joy and gladness and long life. All wisdom cometh from the Lord. Whoso feareth the Lord, it shall go well with him at the last, and he shall find favour in the day of his death. To fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and it was created with the faithful in the womb. She hath built an everlasting foundation with men, and she shall continue with their seed. To fear the Lord is fullness of wisdom, and filleth men with her fruits. She finished all their house with things desirable, and the garners with her increase. The fear of the Lord is a crown of wisdom, making peace and perfect health to flourish, both with which are gifts of God, and it enlarges their rejoicing that love him. Wisdom raineth down skill and knowledge of understanding and exalteth them to honour that hold her fast. The root of wisdom is the fear of Lord, the Lord, and the branches thereof a long life.
I had the great good fortune to be a friend of Tony's for more than 50 years. But like many of his friends, there was one problem with Tony. And it was a problem of what gift to bring him when we visited him. One of his friends knew exactly the gift to bring him. And I'm privileged now at Tony's behest to share that gift with you. A toy for Tony by Seamus Heaney. Fritilla is in flower, the deer. He'll miss them, miss them, and the tower, and choir, and cloisters, fellows' gardens, the office even, and its burdens. And we shall miss his just being there. His sprezzatura, staying power, his presidential head of steam, his smile, his visionary glee. Roads go ever, ever on, over rock and under tree, by caves where never sun has shone, by streams that never find the sea, over snow and by winter sown, and through the merry flowers of June, over grass and over stone, and under mountains in the moon. Roads go ever, ever on under cloud and under star, yet feet that wandering have gone turn at, low, uh, sorry, turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen and horror in the halls of stone look at last on meadows green and trees and hills they long have known. Roads go ever on and on out from the door where it began. Now far ahead the road has gone. Let others follow it who can. Let them a journey new begin, but I at last with weary feet will turn towards the lighted inn, my evening rest and sleep to meet.
Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done. Home art gone and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great. Thou art past the tyrant's stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat. To thee the reed is as the oak. The scepter, learning, physic, must all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all-dreaded thunderstone. Fear no slander, censure rash. Thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must, consign to thee and come to dust. No exerciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee. Quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave.
think, <coughs> I think I can safely say that everyone here in this glorious chapel is here because he or she admired or even loved Tony, and still do. I could certainly count myself amongst such lucky people. We all know of Tony's extraordinarily successful public career, the BBC, the creation of Channel 4, rejuvenating the British Film Institute, to name just three of his biggest public tasks before he arrived in Magdalen in 1988. Everything Tony did, he did superbly. Whereas the Midas touch was a curse, the Tony touch was an unalloyed blessing. Since Tony's death almost two weeks ago, I've been not surprised, but really moved by the astounding numbers of letters and calls of praise and love of Tony that have come to me, to Alistair, his lawyer, to Susan, and to other friends. Tony meant so much to so many people. Thus, a couple of examples. He inspired and meant the world for me from the moment I met him. Leo Crane, one of his many blessed godchildren, of whom my son Conrad is another. Tony was my mentor and life coach, guiding me through childhood and teenage years. He was unique and so generous and so valuable all my life. From Michael and Sylvia Jay, his friends and neighbors in New Elm, Tony had a talent for doing remarkable things and making them seem quite natural, bringing the Magdalen Choir to Paris to sing in Notre Dame and inviting Cardinal Lustiger to preach from the, from the outside pulpit in Magdalen while we all sat in the quad in gently falling rain. A love of Oxford has run through almost all of Tony's life. After an impoverished childhood in wartime Wales, when he and his mother and his sister all lived off the tiny allowance that his elder brother saved from his scholarship money at Oxford, Tony followed him to Brasenose and then won, faithfully and properly, a trainee job at the BBC. He would return to Oxford often, principally to do a research fellowship at St Anthony's before finally coming to Magdalen. His great friend Douglas Murray recently pointed out that Tony never lamented his poor childhood or boasted about making good. Instead, I quote, he used his energies to help as many other people to make good also as he could. No one has ever devoted themselves more successfully than Tony to quietly fundraising for this country's institutions and working for scholarship schemes for needy students. I'm very lucky because I've known Tony a long time. I met him in March 1969 over a shared interest in this awful Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Tony was already a significant person, the editor of 24 Hours, the equivalent of Newsnight today, which he had already turned into an extremely forceful and interesting and talked about radio program, news program. I was a 22-year-old nobody who had just left University College down the road. We met and we talked, we hit it off, and we went on from there to here, 52 years. At the end of 1970, we had an extraordinary adventure. We both wanted to make our first trip to, to Asia, especially to Vietnam, still in the throes of the war. So Tony, of course, got the RAF to fly us free to <laughs> Singapore. And from there, from Singapore, we went by bus and road across Malaysia and Thailand up into Laos. And from Laos, we flew to Cambodia to, and then to Vietnam. In the back of the on, the, on the back page of the order of service that we all have, you'll see Tony's press card in Vietnam, which was, uh, which, and I have a similar one. That was uh, an extraordinary open sesame, that card. With it, you could turn up and turn up un unannounced and travel on any American plane, any American helicopter, any American tank, should you so wish, any American truck, any American boat, 
as long as they had room, of course, and they very often did. It was a complete freedom. This was a laissez-faire city to go wherever you wanted around, around South Vietnam. We hitched many, many rides, and we did occasional reporting and radio spots for the BBC. Vietnam reinformed our lives in very extraordinary ways. Then after Vietnam, it was to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, by ship to Vladivostok to take the Trans-Siberian Railway back home across the USSR. Those 11 days in the train to Moscow with no view through the steamed up windows were perhaps the least exciting part of our journey. However, hours spent in the cafe car drinking borscht when they had any supplies of beetroot and sweet Georgian red wine and reading and talking were wonderful because Tony was, as you know, an extraordinary historian and a raconteur of great wit, a wonderful conservationist, conservation, conservationist and a wonderful companion in all circumstances. Throughout our trip, I learned much more from Tony than he learned from me. I understood better what a unique man he was, a wise man and a good man, brilliant, tender, gracious, generous, both tentative in his manner and decisive in his actions, a reformer who loved English traditions, an agnostic who later adored this chapel and its rituals, as you can see by this exquisite service that he has created. He was a commentator with clearly thought out visions of how the world and especially Britain and British broadcasting could be improved. As Chris Patton says, he was one of the most important leaders of public service broadcasting in the last century. He understood its relationship to the essential values that maintain an open democratic society. It's a pity that that extraordinary resource that he represented was not able to be more fully deployed in the world of broadcasting. But fortunately, Tony had many, many other visions as well as broadcasting, many other passions. And one of the greatest supporters of his visions and his passions was Paul Getty, whom Tony often visited when Getty was in constant, a constant patient in the London Clinic in the 1980s. Paul's widow, Victoria, recalls that she first met Tony in Paul's hospital room. She said to me, Paul said on his way to the bathroom, tell Tony he can have the 20 million. <laughs> I was a bit astonished, said, said Victoria, but I repeated it to Tony. You can have the 20 million. He said, what? Gosh, well, heavens. His surprise, said Victoria, was so sweet. I just wanted to hug him and to ruffle his hair. But he would not have liked that. <laughs> his sweetness, she said, disguised his brilliance, his humanity, his loyalty to his friends. I grew to love him, as Paul did. Tony was at that time director of the British Film Institute. Paul's money, coupled with Tony's own enthusiasm and organizational genius, helped him to transform a neglected and moribund institution into one of the greatest centers of film history and education in the world. He created the Museum of the Moving Image, took the London Film Festival to the regions. He opened up the British Film Institute, the BFI, to Russian films and directors. Under Tony, the BFI restored and promoted the films of Powell and Pressburger and enabled the creation enabled the creation of the two last films of the great Russian director, Andrei Tarkovsky. Paul, Ge Paul Getty gave Tony some 50 million pounds for the BFI and many more millions for other projects, including this wonderful college. Maudlin, in the 1980s, became the most important home that Tony had ever created for himself, let alone for the thousands and thousands of students who came to study and live under his care here. And Susan will take you further into Maudlin than I can. Thank you. Tony didn't want a memorial service. He wanted this funeral service here in Maudlin, in the heart of the chapel and the choir. He wanted us here 
remembering him, the people that he worked with, the people he enabled, he valued, the people he disagreed with, the people he agreed with, argued with, the people he loved. He suggested much of this service himself, but not all of it. A fortnight ago, there was no particular maudlin tradition for the funeral of a great president. Now there is. Tony would entirely approve. If you don't have the tradition you need, make one. Tony was a great traditionalist, but for him, the traditions served the institutions and the institution, its purpose and its people. Loyalty ran very deep with him. Earlier in life, he'd argued that you had to have solidarity with your trades union. Now, his solidarity with the college was absolute and his sense of its importance unquestionable. Even irony was rare, though it was sometimes there at his own expense. There's one panel of the great lion hunt base relief from Nineveh hangs in the lodgings. There beside a beautiful lioness is an inscription, and he would take you round and he would translate. Ashur Banipal, he would say. Ashur Banipal, king of kings, lord of the lands from west to east, president of Maudlin. <laughs> Tony was Tony Prez to undergraduates, to all students, for 17 years, from 1988 to 2005. He knew the college. He knew its academics and staff, its graduates and undergraduates. He knew every corner of it. He had enthusiasm, he had energy, he had a plan for Maudlin and, and for us, and we were probably going to have to have fun doing it. In his not very retired life after Maudlin, Tony was irritated by people who wanted him to raise money for their causes. I'm not a fundraiser, he said. They think of me as a fundraiser and I'm not. This from a man who, as you've already heard, had an all but incomparable address book and used it to transform Maudlin's finances. Uh, John Paul Getty once asked me what I thought of Tony Smith. And I told him, hmm, said Getty, but he's an expensive man to know. <laughs> and so the generous found him. All the same, he was right. He wasn't a fundraiser, he was a visionary and his ambitions for the college were huge. He often said wistfully that the founders hadn't thought of Magdalen as a new college, but as a new university, outside the walls of Oxford as they were then. He had a clear picture of it, us, flourishing, an intellectual powerhouse and a magnet, visible, influential, effective in the world beyond us, an intellectual elite with an open welcome to all, but he was a pragmatist with a clear eye for our existing limitations and an opportunist's list of what we needed in practice. A brilliantly conceived science park, old quarries opened up for new building, an existing state brought into good order and great beauty. We needed to look the part of a national and international institution. We needed to fund students from all backgrounds. He found the donors and they gave. They gave to Tony's vision. Great figures stalked the cloisters of Tony's Maudlin. You could come from drinks in the lodgings with Arvo Pert and find yourself sitting next to Paul McCartney at dinner. Kofi Annan choppered in, Václav Havel hung out, Seamus Heaney was there at breakfast, Richard Attenborough filmed, the Prince of Wales visited, Princess Margaret sang Cole Porter. Stella, but serious. Tony's and Maudlin's relationship, the relationship you've already heard about with Bhutan, began when the current king studied here. Tony took deep delight in his continued friendship with a remarkable country and a profoundly good man and good king. A week before Tony died, I held the phone to his ear while the king told a possibly unconscious Tony how much he loved him and how grateful he was. Because Tony was deeply proud of all of us. You didn't have to be a king. He wanted us all to succeed and be happy. And he did his very best to make sure we did succeed. As academics,
Interesting. <laughs> oh, well, we all have printer problems from time to time. Um, as academics, as politicians, as playwrights, as filmmakers, as tech entrepreneurs, as researchers, as thinkers and doers, and just as good citizens. It was, in the end, a very simple aim for a clever, complex, astute, and sophisticated man. If you went to Tony with a question or a problem, whoever you were, you might get tea, if it was the right time of day, and sympathy, yes, but sympathy which took the form of listening, grasping the problem, and working out how he could help. Tony made things happen. And he went on making things happen from his cottage in New Elm, from his chambers in Albany, till only a few weeks before he died. We here today stand for many, many more who will miss him. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I'm almost ended, you'll be glad to know. But I just uh, thought that we, we cannot close our eulogies to Tony without mentioning one uh, other of his extraordinary visions and, um, and, uh, and achievements, and that's his, relationships, his relationship with Russia. I've talked already about the films that he, um, the way in which he uh, got the BFI to concentrate on Russian films. And this, the other thing that he did was enormous work for students in Russia. He chaired the Oxford Russia Fund, and he persuaded the Hodorowsky Foundation, a very, very rich foundation, uh, to, to um, finance more than 35,000 Russian students to study humanities inside Russia itself. And then there was the Hill Foundation, which he also chaired, based here. And that foundation gave scholarships to 165 Russian students to study in Oxford itself. Alistair, his lawyer, received a Russian obituary just yesterday, praising Tony. And this is what the Russian obituary said. The nobility of spirit and energy embodied by Tony Smith, Anthony Smith, the depth of understanding of issues of any scale, his amazing openness and inexhaustible faith in understanding, bet in understanding between peoples is the rare gift of a great man the rare gift of a great man, which he displayed in so many occasions throughout his life to so many people and so many institutions. He regarded institutions as the bedrock and the building blocks of any society, and he did so much for them in this country. Some years ago, um, and, and this, this, this uh, sorry, I, I wanted to quote you once more from Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray said recently, not for nothing, that the obituaries will probably say that Tony had no children. That's not true. He had thousands of us. And as the Russian obituary shows, from many parts of the world. Some years ago, Tony gave a sermon here in this glorious chapel. It was, in effect, a love letter to the history of this chapel and to Oxford itself. He ended this very learned sermon lecture by saying this, today, as your bus from London bursts through that great cleft in the Chilterns on the M40, you see on the spreading plain below a permanent mist rising from the holy city of Oxford. It always thrills. I often think that it is the miasma of prayer rising from the cathedral, the countless churches and chapels and the new scattering of mosques, synagogues, and temples around the city. It is as if the prayers rise from these sources, these many sources, layer upon layer, and lodge in the ether. Their, their varying colors spread across a changing sky, and it is the music of many choirs that fuels their upward journey, melting away the controversies behind the varieties of belief and unbelief. This is the real gift of the ancestors, in physical and audible form, in architecture and music, an eternal gift to those who pass below.
Now, in conclusion, I would just like to say that several, there are several people in the, in the chapel today who looked after Tony in, in his last weeks incredibly great, kindly and generously. They, they include Sheila and Yuri and Kat. And, um, and of course, there is also here his, his uh, wonderful housekeeper, Silvana Razzo, his Brazilian housekeeper for the last 14 years. And this is what she said about Tony. It's quite hard to read, I'm afraid. It's difficult to describe how wonderful Tony was. The most generous person I ever met, kind and humble. He was always worried about my welfare. I will never forget his beautiful face sitting in his chair and saying, Silvana, your old friend is not well today. And I would make him a cup of tea with his favorite Portuguese custard cake. I will love him forever. We are going to meet again in heaven. Thank you. Now, uh, a, 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 a tiny announcement. There was a bus going to go to the Tony's burial at U, in U Elm at 3.15. It's now, because the lunch has been canceled because of COVID, going to be at 2.15. So do let me or Alistair know if you, those, those close friends and family who wish to go to U Elm. Thank you so much.
Let us pray. O eternal God, before whose face the generations rise and pass away, thyself unchanged, abiding. We bless thy holy name for all who have completed their earthly course in thy faith and following and are now at rest. We remember before thee this day, Tony Smith, rendering thanks unto thee for his gift of friendship and loyalty, for his high sense of duty and integrity, for his service to this college, and for the courage and inspiration of his leadership. To him, with all the faithful departed, grant thy peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them, and in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of thy perfect will. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Support us, O Lord, all the day long of this troublous life, until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then, Lord, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Magnified and sanctified, be the great name of God in the world which he created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom in your life and in your days and in the lifetime of all his people. Quickly and speedily may it come and let us say amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Thou only art immortal, the creator and maker of man. And we are mortal, formed of the earth, and unto earth shall we return. For so thou didst ordain when thou createdst us, saying, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. All we go down to the dust, yet weeping o'er the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints. Tony, child of God, go forth upon thy journey from this world in the name of God the Father who created thee, in the name of God the Son who redeems thee, in the name of God the Holy Spirit who gave thee life. In communion with the blessed, with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven, may thy dwelling this day be in peace and thy home in the heavenly Jerusalem. And may the angels of God watch over you all. May Christ give you grace to live as those who hope and trust in the resurrection to eternal life. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.